The Molen automotive stock has been the topic of many conversations as of late, and in today's video, we're going to look at its price actions, the recent developments, the technicals, and my opinion on if you should be buying the stock. As the market is very volatile at the moment, we should be mindful about which positions to pick, as well as their individual timing and exposure. Before the video begins, if you would like to see more stock analysis videos like this one, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Molan has had a bit of ups and downs over the past few months, as we mentioned in previous videos. The company initially wanted to publish the identity of a Fortune 500 client they are working with, and ultimately they didn't disclose that information in the press release at the end of June. The stock fell somewhat as a result, which, as mentioned previously, isn't probably is not going to impact significantly the company's outlook. We're going to talk about this later, but basically, when we look at Mullen, so far it's not really a question of if the company has a long-term potential, because even if it does, that's not really why we're here for. Most of us are here because the short-term profit potential, and that is even more relevant because the stock is currently at a low level since the $1 level has been held so far despite the recent little issue with regards to communication. Now, with regards to what happened with the short-term price action, like because the company didn't release uh, the identity of the Fortune 500 client, we were expecting the Armageddon, but frankly, this didn't happen. And what this tells me is that a very significant way of what's going to influence the short-term price action is going to be the capital appetite for risk. And whatever happens to the company itself is not going to matter that much. If we just look at what kind of price levels we're talking about, like most people trading the stock kind of know what they should get as a return. So th this is what I mean by the importance of this kind of company-specific fundamental news. I think that they're going to picture like they're going to paint a certain tone, but they're not going to influence significantly of how well or badly stock will do. Now, let's also take a look at the technicals of Molen. The trading volume of Molen Automotive has recently been 61 million shares versus an average volume of 55 million. Over the previous 52 week period, the price fluctuated between 52 cents and $15.09. The trading volume is a metric telling me how many shares are being exchanging hands and whether there's a lot of activities and attention going on. It also often gives you a first idea about the popularity of the stock, because when we use it to compare with the average volume, it can also tell us if the company is enjoying additional momentum to reverse the trend or to break through the current resistance levels. Even when the current volume is lower than the average, it is an interesting indication because it can send us hints about potential reversals. The market cap of Molen is currently around $355 million compared to an enterprise value of $112 million. To put simply, the market cap is the fair market value the company has based on the current market sentiment, the company's reputation, and other macroeconomic factors. Whereas the enterprise value is usually the cost the company has already paid for its assets after paying off the debts. It's worth mentioning that one of the most significant assets for a lot of growth companies is the intangibles. So they're not items that can be used to generate income immediately, but they're essentially pledges that the company can grow significantly in the future, such as intellectual properties and brands. For startups, most of their valuations are based in the intangibles, meaning if they've been valued in more favorable market terms, this can have a huge difference between the market cap and the enterprise value, and it can also easily give us a false impression that a company is trading at a discount. It's only trading below the book value, but it doesn't mean that a company itself is necessarily undervalued. It's also possible that a company itself was overvalued in the first place and that it has deflated itself ever since. As we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 31% higher than the one-month low, 56% higher than the three-month low, and 127% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which gives us a hint about the market sentiment, 
of where the stock price is likely going to head next, the implied volatility is 225% versus a historical volatility of 115%. The put call volume ratio is currently at 0 0.15, and it's normal for most stocks to have a higher put option volume than what they truly deserve because many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 24,000 contracts a day versus the 30-day average volume of 41,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 522,000 contracts compared to the 30-day average of 473,000 contracts. The option contract is a derivative from the underlying security, giving participants the possibility to have a right to either buy or sell the security at a predetermined strike price. Buying the contract gives you the right, and selling the contract gives you the premiums, with an obligation to execute the contract if the counterparty chooses to do so. It is often said that you can evaluate the likelihood of a scenario based on the opposite of what the current ratio is. If there's a lot of put options, then there might be a possible uptrend on the move, or that the reversal could happen if there's a lot of call options. The reasoning behind that theory is quite simple. Most people try to catch up on an event that has already ended, and most of these options expire worthless. In terms of shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own about 1.6% of the outstanding shares, the biggest shareholders being Citadel, Vanguard and Susquehanna. It's relevant to understand the shareholder composition of a company as this can help us to determine if you should hold the stock long term or to view it as a trade opportunity. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, it could be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long term trust from shareholders. Typically, the consensus is that there should be at least 25 to 30 percent of institutional participation for the stock to be perceived as a sound investment, not just a short-term trade. There's obviously a lot of exceptions, as many great titles are also held by retail, but that tends to be the exception and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes there are significant short interest in the total volume, and that could be a sign that there's an organized shorting operation going on, such as what happened with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is 11% of the total float, with 48% of the transactions coming out of the dark pools. Usually, if the short interest is above 15% of the total volume, with a significant portion of the short volume coming out of the dark pools, this may be a sign that institutional positions have been taken to short the stock, and that there would be potentials for a short squeeze. My recommendation overall is to have Molen as a trading position with a time window between 4 to 6 weeks and with a profit target between 30 to 50%. If you believe that the stock has a long-term potential, then have a separate position on the side and hold it for at least 12 months. I would recommend to commit between 3 to 5% of your portfolio and will also recommend to split the allocation in batches of 20% at a time so that you can purchase more if it retraces further. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With well, the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, 
versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option, and assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles, either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, the degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations, and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When companies announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include Having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up, forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.